the people at Ummah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them for facilitating this every night. And for all of you brothers and sisters, driving from Kenton, Flint, Ann Arbor, uh, Dearborn, uh, Warren, Hamtramck, did I miss a city? Farmington Hills, what, Ypsilani, is that a city? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I lived there for 20 years, don't worry. Uh, Ypsilani, anyone else? Sterling Heights, Shelby, uh, Rochester, Arban Hills, everyone that's here, I said Dearborn Sharif. I didn't say Dearborn, I said Dearborn Sharif. Lansing, someone's here from Lansing? Where? Ahlan wa sahlan. I don't think you're here for us, you're here for your family. You know, we will still count you in. Lansing's here, alhamdulillah. Takbir. Uh, and again, I say this every night, uh, sitting with uh, Sheikh al Murray and Muft Mufti Abdul Wahab, such an honor, such a privilege to um, just to listen to them. Uh, as much as you guys are here to listen and learn, I'm here to listen and learn also. Yesterday, when they were both talking, um, you know, they, they, they taught me a lot. And I hate to admit, this young brother of mine, he's teaching me. You know, it's hard, it's hard to admit that kind of stuff. But a lot of the stuff he's repeating is my old, old speeches <laughs> that I forgot. Like, those old lectures, you know. And I don't even know if I gave those lectures, but I'm just claiming them. And then some of the stuff he's saying is, you know, it's an amazing how Sheikh al-Masmari and Mufti Bilhab can engage this late at night. May Allah reward them. Tonight, we're going to flip the script a little bit. We've been talking about um, the, the final uh, series. But I, I really want to talk about how people are successful in their finals, like in their final stages in life. And they're called as -sabiqun. You know, sa the sabiqoons are the ones who have the best fi final, uh, you know, endings. They're the people... They came first, they strived first, they were the dedicated people. They were not just sabiqun, they were also awwaloon. Why will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala call someone who is sabiq awwal? Isn't sabiq the person exceeding and advancing the first? No, there's, there's sabiqun and there's awwaloon. Is, is it a taqid? One interpretation would be they're sabiq, they're the ones who haste. Most people who are in a rush or in haste to something, Say you are the sabiq to get the new iPhone, correct? Most likely you'll be one of the first to get the iPhone because you're standing outside the Apple shop, correct guys? Or the new PlayStation or console that's coming out for people who are into that kind of stuff. So if you're a sabiq, most likely you're awwal. But why is Allah repeating something? So there could be a discussion here, is sabiq and awwal two different things? Or is it the same thing? We'll talk about that today. You know, and and they're not just in one era. Allah says, وَالسَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ مِنَ الْمُحَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ They came in the early generation from the pious people who migrated and who also received the people who migrated, the Ansar. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he could have concluded the ayah but gave space to other generations to come. وَالَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُمْ بِإِحْسَانِ And those who follow them with excellence. So you could be a sabiqoon today. But you were not from the awwaloon. But even then, you can be considered to the awwaloon. Wasabiqoon al awwaloon. You strive like those people. Walladhi tabaghum bi ihsan. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says about such people. Radi Allahu anhum wa radu an. So you're, we are getting the same title that the Sahaba got in the Quran. Radi Allahu anhum wa radu an. Wa adda lahum jannat in tajri tahta al anharu khalidin fiha. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says jannat is prepared for them, and you know this is a great reward. Thalik al fawzul azim. So we should be excited to be here, you know, sitting in the front, being here early, in that kind of lifestyle of in every perspective, not to procrastinate in any relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Being the first there, these are the people who make it uh, early to Fajr. These are the people who make it for Tahajjud. These are the people before death comes, they're prepared to leave. So inshallah, we'll speak about these people. And uh, I like Sheikh al Mazmari. I, I really, you know, I, I ask the same question. I feel like I'm running out of the same question, but I, I ask the same question all the time. The wardrobe that he has, he's his sabiqun for sure. He's the first one to buy him, first one to wear him. Mashallah. You, You're looking fresh too, mashallah. No, I just zipped up a little bit too high. You know, I got to breathe now. People, everyone's telling me I'm losing weight. Everyone's like, you're losing weight, Sheikh Abdullah. I was like, yes. And everybody knows. I've been fasting all month. <laughs> <laughs> That's what. It's a surprise. So, Sheikh Al-Masmari, uh, may Allah reward you. We'll start with you, inshallah. Sheikh, uh, can you give us 
the importance of being from those who are the forerunners, the people who strive to be early, to be in advance. And is it just coincidentally they were the first people to be, is Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, a coincident that he's the first one to believe in Islam? And then he's the first Khalifa, the first one to bury next to the Prophet. What, how has this happened? Or is it by the mentality of these personalities? So Sheikh Al-Masmari will give you the mic. Bismillah. Jazakumullah khair. Takbir. MashaAllah. Okay, Bismillah. Salatu salam ala Rasulullah. Just to let you know, I think what makes this unique, you know the definition of a khatira? Khatira is a passing thought. So it's not something that you prepare for. And this is why... Ibn Josie has a book, Sayyidul Khatir, where he, he captures his own thoughts and then documents those thoughts. So we've agreed to some extent all the time that there's a few themes and a few topics, but we decide very quick. And I feel that for me, that's very impactful. You know, so right now we're like, okay, let's talk about Sabiqun. And, and, and subhanAllah, I do see that effective because everyone shares um, from their heart what they find to be beneficial. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Shaykh Abdullah prepares before he comes. He's, pre <laughs> He's preparing. He's preparing for uh, I didn't know the topic. I mean, but none of us do. None of us do. Shaykh Abdullah just gave the khutbah last week. So he's prepared. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Okay. Um, so when we're talking about Sabiqun, subhanAllah, something crossed my mind at Maghrib time. And it just surprises me that you all uh, chose this topic, my dear Mashaykh. I thought to myself because someone came downstairs and was talking about Ummah and so many people talk about Miftah. You know, so more people, of course, everything that Miftah is doing, may Allah reward you all. Thank you, Sheikh. It's so nice. No, and wallahi, that plug in? Wallahi, like... I mean it. Wallahi, I mean it. Like what happens or what would happen if you walked into Miftah after all of these years? Let's not use the ikhlas game. Like, I, I really mean it. Inshallah, I know you so all are so back. sincere. Let me see his face. Wallah, you all are so... I, I, I testify to Allah in front of everyone here that you all are very sincere based on what we know. But what if you walked in and the hall was empty? What if we walked into Ummah and no one was here? Just no one. Imagine how many years you've put into the institution and then you plan for something, no one comes. For a year, no one comes. Two years, no one comes. You can't tell me, oh, alhamdulillah, we're doing it for Allah. And there's, there is a, a crush inside. It hurts. It hurts. This is how Quran defines a sabq. A sabq is that you may never experience the results. Imagine we have more people coming to Ummah than the followers of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Imagine. In your typical masjid, you have more people coming for taraweeh than the followers of Ibrahim a.s. But Allah honored Ibrahim. Sabq is to believe in something and to act upon that belief knowing and believing you may not ever see the results. Isn't that hard? But this is what makes them unique. These people are so unique that they see Allah and they're willing to do whatever it takes because they envision Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why did Allah praise the muhajirun? Because they committed to Allah and His Prophet before seeing any results. Not only that, nothing made sense from the beginning. They were tortured, they were punished, they were uh, imprisoned, they were sold, they were exiled, but they still believed in Allah. Why does Allah praise these individuals, the people of Sabq? And the people that came later on, he says, لا يستوي من من آمن من قبل فتح وقاتل. You do not align with the people that believe before Fatih. Don't compare yourself to Abu Bakr, and Umar, Uthman, Ali, Hassan, Hussein, and the rest of the Sahaba. Just don't compare. You're way off. Because they believed at a moment where it did not make sense. If anything, it was very destructive to believe. Imagine going into something that does not exist and you have to lose everything that is already there. It's hard. Because you're not seeing it. You're like, okay, this is not worth it. This is an idea that may die out. And I'm going to lose my family in the process. I'm going to lose my wealth. Like, why should I even invest something where it just doesn't align? 
And subhanallah, the people of Sabq are, their, their, their remembrance in the Quran is very clear because they were able to overcome logistics. They were able to overcome the, the, the presence of humankind. They were able to overcome everything and anything knowing that Allah is their maqsood. Allah is their goal. So anything that you and I are doing, do we envision that? This is how we're going to be next to Abu Bakr and Umar. When Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu embraced Islam, he had nothing to gain and everything to lose. His only gain was Allah and the Prophet But no materialistic gains. Nothing. And all the Sahaba knew the moment they sign into Islam, they sign out from luxury. It's a sign in, sign out. This, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Look at the Ansar. That's why they're sabq. Like the Ansar, they were happy that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to them. But what was the sign-off document? أَن تَحْمُونِي مِمَّا تَحْمُوا بِهِ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَمْوَالَكُمْ وَأَبْنَاءَكُمْ وَنِسَاءَكُمْ That you will protect me. Imagine, protect whom? In the end, what did Rasulullah do for them? Early on. Like how much love was there? But they believed and they acted upon that belief. That's it. We respond to the belief. And if this call happens to have some of what I believe, I will be there. These are the committed people that the ummah needs. All over the world, people that are committed. And they signed off their lives, their lives for Allah. And the Prophet wasallam praised them and they were deserving of Allah's praise and the Prophet's praise They were so committed to this cause of sabq that Allah mentions in Surah Tabuk that the Sahabi that wasn't able to participate in Tabuk and, and did not have the capacity, did not have uh, the rai, did not have uh, an army uh, armor, did not have a sword, so decided to leave and asked the Prophet ﷺ for support. And the Prophet said, I have nothing to give you. There's nothing I can offer. Subhanallah, this person left in a state of tears. Why? Because he couldn't sacrifice himself. You see the difference? He cried because he wasn't considered to be among the sabq. And he left in the state of tears. We would say, Alhamdulillah, I did what I can. And the Rasulullah himself said, I can't do anything. Adios. We're done. Call it a day, call it a night. But he, subhanallah, he, subhanallah, um, left in a state of tears. I end with this. The reason why the Sahaba were pushing for Uhud is that they wanted to be like the people of Badr. Sabq. They felt so bad. The, especially the youth. Youth, we have, we, you know? We have, come on, wallah we are. Wallah, we're still youth. We just act old because of this clothes. Wallah, wallah, we're all youth. Sabq, they're like, Ya Rasulullah, let's get out. Allah has honored the people of Badr and we need a similar honor. And again, nothing was still there. They haven't experienced victory to begin with. But it shows you the mindset of the Sahaba. Ridwanullahi alayhim ajma'i. Takbir. Can give Sheikh al Mazmari a round of applause, guys. Come on. Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah, Sheikh. You prepared for this topic. You sound overprepared. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Um, Sheikh Abdul Wahab, of course, I want you to, you're, you're, you're itching to speak, you know? So. <laughs> so. <laughs> this guy's always making fun of me. Go ahead. This guy is driving me back yesterday. He's so excited to go back to the next masjid, driving so fast, gets pulled over, you know? And then he's like, officer, he's like, officer, I'm fasting tomorrow. Let's give me a break. It's like one o'clock. No one's fasting right now. He's like, I, I got to fast tomorrow. I got to make it for suhoor, which is three hours later. The officer looks at him, you know, and he lets him go. He lets him go. So, you know, alhamdulillah, you know, I just want, I, inshallah, you get reward for all the tickets you got. <laughs> I got pulled over twice yesterday um, But once I got away Because Sheikh Abdullah's barakah was with me The first time on the way to Ummah I didn't get away So I'll tell you the No, 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 he goes The officer comes in He's like, the window's like Sir, how's your record? I'm like, horrible <laughs> 
He's like, he's shocked. He's like, who are you? I'm like, this is my younger brother. I'm telling you, he's a horrible driver. Give him a ticket. I was playing reverse psychology on him. <laughs> All right? And he comes back, no ticket. I remember I got pulled over once, speeding somewhere. He's like, what's the hurry, sir? We go so fast. As I'm trying to catch the last quarter of the Lions game. He's like, they suck back then. Not anymore. You know, like, he's like, they're not going to win anyways. You're going to watch them lose. Goes, comes back, no ticket. He's like, just have fun. You know, they're humans too. Allah guide them. And the ones who are horrible, Allah guide them. I mean, yalla. Sorry, I'm sorry. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, rahim So, Sheikh already spoke about um, such a beautiful definition of musabaqa. I told Sheikh Abdullah, I'm a, I will probably speak for a few minutes only. I'm actually fairly tired today. Um, and Sheikh Abdullah looking really ready. You know, you know, beautiful clothes. Sheikh Masmi always looks good. Um, and they sh- should speak much more today. Um, the Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he speaks about musabaqa, which is a competitive edge that every single human being has. So first of all, let's remind ourselves, this idea of sabaqa is something that everyone possesses. We simply choose to channel it in places that we seek the outcome of. And we don't see we don't we don't we don't channel it in places where we don't seek the outcome from. Uh, before Ramadan began, um, some of the brothers and sisters they set up a beautiful qiyam and the actual topic is Janan's right here, mashallah, the topic was of musabaqa and sabaqa. And I remember speaking about we spoke about in that session that you can only be competitive in something that you are attracted to the outcome of. If you don't have if you're not attracted to the outcome, then why would you be competitive for it? It's like asking someone who is not attracted by uh, video games to be competitive in Fortnite. They won't know how to. They don't have the pulse to be competitive in it because the outcome does not drive them. And then if you ask someone who doesn't enjoy playing basketball and sports to be competitive on the floor, they won't be able to. This is why sometimes people see us pl- people playing basketball and hockey and sports. Like, what's wrong with you guys? And then we say, well, you know, we're competitive because the outcome is attractive. What's the outcome? Nothing, just that we want, right? That's all we have, but it's enough for us to be, it's enough, it's enough for us to, to drive us and to push us forth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to speak about musabaqa, He actually speaks about the outcome as well. And that outcome is the most attractive outcome. And if a person understands what the reward is to use our competitive edge for the aspects of our deen, then this outcome will truly be present for us in this world and in the akhirah. And what is that outcome? أُولَٰئِكَ muqarrabun. That these are people who will be able to be close to Allah, not only in this world, but in the akhirah. The goal of life is to be able to benefit from the nearness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The goal of life is to be able to take from the treasures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the people, because of their competitive edge and earning their akhirah, their reward Allah says is, أُولَٰئِكَ muqarrabun. That the, before speaking about Jannah, before speaking about Firdaus, Allah says, they will be close to me. Imagine someone said to us that in one gathering you'll be sitting in a room. You have it, you have we say in English, we have a seat on the table. That I have a seat on the table. You have a seat on the table with LeBron James, MJ, Michael Jordan, and Steph Curry. What would you do for that? People run to get those raffle tickets. They'll do anything to win that ticket, to be competitive for it. They'll trample upon each other for it. This is what the Prophet says, if you knew the reward of praying in the first saf, you would trample upon each other to get there. If you knew the reward of calling the adhan, you would fight for it. But a person that knows the reward for it and still doesn't fight for it, it simply means that you and I are not attracted enough to the reward. It's not attractive enough yet. And the reason why things are not attractive to us is because of one or two reasons. Number one, it's too distant from us. It's just too far. And then we remind ourselves that death is closer to us in our own shoelace. So that it's not too distant. Number two, because we just simply don't believe it. And that's also false because there's nothing more true than the akhirah. And so going back to what I was saying originally, these are people that were able to be competitive for the aspects of the akhirah because they were attracted to the outcome of being amongst the muqarrabun. Being amongst those that were close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have sabqa. Everyone is competitive. We just choose to place it and channel it where we see fitting for our for our outcomes that we intend, for our objectives of life. And those are people that their objective of life was only one thing, or their consolidated frame of reference was only one thing. So therefore they were able to be competitive for it. There are two types of rushing, and I'll end with this. One is called ajla. 
And one is called Sabaqa. Al-ajla to min shaytan Ajla or ujla, which means to be hasty, to be always in a rush. This is something that is from shaytan. While sabqa is praiseworthy in the Quran and is spoken about in such a beautiful manner, what's the difference? Whoever has one will not have the other. Whoever has one will not have the other. Ajla or ujla is, is, is commonly seen to be amongst the munafiqun. And sabqa is commonly seen to be amongst the believers. What is the difference? Those sabqa is to rush towards the act of goodness. Sabqa is to rush towards the act of goodness. Someone is struggling, I'm the first one there. Someone needs help, I'm the first one to answer their call. Someone, someone needs some money, I'm the first one to give it to them. That's sabqa. The sahabas would prepare whatever they have, waiting for the Prophet to ask them. They were just waiting, Prophet, please ask me, because I've been preparing for it for so long. In a ujala or ajala is to rush while doing the act of goodness. Those who rush to get there will not rush to complete it. And those who get there late will always try to finish quick. And this is why the munafiqun, their quality that is identified in the Quran is the opposite of sabqa, which is to delay. That they just like to delay, 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 delay. So if I'm not, if I'm, if I don't know what sabqa is, I at least know what delaying is. And delaying is the opposite of sabqa. If I have the opportunity to show up somewhere and I say, I'll just go later, this phrase is synonymous to what the munafiqun would, would say. And when they would, they would get there late, so whenever you're late, you're always trying to rush the act. When you get late to the meal, you're eating fast. When you get late to a da'wah, you're you know, doing something fast. When you get, whatever you get late to, you're always rushing in the act. And whatever you rush to get to early, you're always taking your time to finish it. This is why the sahabas would pray their prayer with ease. Al-anatu min Allah. Whereas the munafiqun, qawamun yasat, qawamun kusala, la yathkurun Allah illa qalila. Because they're just trying to get out as quick as possible. So if, you know, al-ashya'u yubayyinu bi I want to try to be for myself and all of us as relatable as possible in this specific subject. This subject is not something which is too far-fetched. It's not a, it's not a theme or a topic that is too spiritual. It's something which each and every one of us deal with on a daily basis. We see in our life, those who rush towards things, they succeed in them. And those who delay them, they meet on a field called tomorrow. Meaning, they never really get anywhere in life. The same is, for the, the same, the, the same is true for the sake of the Akhirah. If we're delaying, that means we're not sabiq. And if we're sabiq, that means hopefully we're not, we don't have the quality of the munafiqun, which is to always delay an act of goodness. But both of them, if, found, if one is found, the other is absent. And if the other is found, the other positive one may be absent from our lives. Wallahu alam. Takbir. Takbir, mashallah. Man, wow, Mufti Abdul Wahab, you prepare. That, that's 2012 speech. Yeah, that's 2012. Mashallah, I, I, that the shaitan, uh, the, the comparison of the sabqa of a believer and the, and the ujla of uh, munafiqun, amazing uh, analysis of the Quran. May Allah bless you. Uh, give him a round of applause, guys, young man. You know, you get so happy when you do this. You know, um, you know brothers and sisters and friends, uh, these two people have said so much. Uh, I feel like in, in dunya too, there's just like this hunger, you know, for more. And when you when you when you make, like, say you're looking for a salary, or a six figure, seven figure, whatever you're trying to make, and some usually seven, seven figure. Say, I mean, to your dua. Say, I mean, you know, yeah, I haven't made it, but if he said it, inshallah, I'll make it. You know, say, I mean, <laughs> like, what's wrong with it? You know, some scholars are like, no, no, I don't want to be rich, but deep down they want to be rich. I'm not one of those. Yeah, Allah, I'll take it. You know. You know, alhamdulillah. By the way, it's not from Miftah, guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Flint, man. Flint, guys. <laughs> alhamdulillah. Listen up, guys. So this hunger concept that people have in dunya. Some people, you give them a simple car, they're satisfied. They go in nine to five. They're like, you know, I like my life. I got my little condo. You know, I, I don't, I'm, they're not even thinking about marriage. They just want to relax. This is, and some people, they got so much, but they're still hungry for more. They want more. They want more opportunities. There, there's, Goal driven A believer He's always hungry For the pleasure of Allah That in the, in the the amazing thing About the hunger Of the pleasure of Allah The hunger of rida Is that Once you taste it You get even more Excited for it You want more of that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Knows that the soul Will want more Because How much can you eat You get full Khalas you, you're not, Iftar You're so hungry And then you eat Like can you have some more Like guys I just 
done. Makluba ate the whole thing. You know how much more can I have? You look, you look at it, and you're sad because you want to eat more, but you can't. That's that's the dunya, that's the jism. The body's capacity of hunger is limited. Marriage, desires, food. How much you could you could want? The Prophet ﷺ said, "Lo anna li ibn Adam wadiya min dhab ahabba yakun lahu wadiyan." If he has a value of gold, you want more because that's his his greed for it. But sometimes, really, our, our desires are limited to how much we can satisfy them in a capacity wise, even our needs. The need of the ruh can, is something greater. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He speaks to the people about their needs, He says, "Fam shufi manakibiya wa kulu mirzki." When it comes to eating and drinking and enjoying life, I want you to walk on earth. Do it. When he talks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, speaks about dhikr of Allah. Allah says, Fas'aw ila dhikrillah. I want you to be more quick about that idea. Just don't walk towards me, but I want you to be more thoughtful, more careful, more you know, active in that dhikr. When Allah says about good deeds, like, you know, he doesn't say famshu. He says, Wasari'u ila maghfiratim min rabbikum. I want you to Race. I want you to run. I want you to be. I want you to pace yourself. Surah. Make it quicker. When Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, when it comes to Allah, not maghfira, not dhikr. When it's Allah, when it comes to Allah, His own essence, Allah doesn't say sariu fastabiqu. He says fafiru, fafiru ila Allah. It's not about stabiqul khirat. Stabiqul khirat is when you're competing with someone. You know, fastabiq al bab. When Zulaikha and Yusuf are running the same direction, who's getting there first? In f- Firar is when you're running away from something dangerous. When there's a lion or there's a snake chasing you, you like Musa alayhi salam, you know, you ran, didn't look back because looking back will slow you down. To run towards Allah, not to look back at the shaitan, the dunya, just pacing yourself, you know, sprinting yourself towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So brothers and sisters, I, I, like what Shaykh Masmari said, a lot of times the people who were the earliest or the forerunners didn't see the results. And from one of the people that I wanted to me and Sheikh Masmur and Mufti Bilhab can add on to this. Who do you think was one of the early forerunners that did not see the results of their struggles? Can you can you guys say some names? Anybody? Sorry, guys? Sumayya. Okay, mashallah. From the Sahaba. Anybody else? Come on. Ali? Ali did Allah and live long, brother. He he was he accepted Islam at 10, he lived to like 70. You know, he saw he saw the conquest of Persia. He saw the conquest of Rome. He saw a lot of that. But I want some names. Someone said Jafar? Jafar radiallahu, okay. Jafar radiallahu anhu, again, he did see Fateh Makkah. Musa ibn Umair, he, a good one, guys. I like that Musa ibn Who said Khadija? Who's that sister? Oh, yeah, sister Umm Bishr. And I heard one brother here who said Khadija and I ignored him. You know? Uh, who said Khadija here? Someone said Khadija. You, okay, yeah. I, 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 I thought I heard it. Yes. Hamza radiallahu anh. But you know, I just have to say a little bit about Khadija, if you don't mind, guys. The first, Hamza didn't accept Sabiqun right away. Like, if you compare Hamza to Khadija, there's six years of difference. Six years of difference. Yes, Hamza is a shaheed, but he's a shaheed way later than Sumayya. And you know, and Yasir, there's Shuhada way before Hamza. But of the first woman to rich, prominent, you know, successful, Knowing, you know, the challenges of believing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but the first person to support the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I, oh, when, I, when, I, in, when I read the, the narration of Iqra, and when the Prophet comes back from the cave, and Khadija is sitting at home, and Prophet's shivering. You know the famous narration. You know, I, I, want to, I want to tone it down because there's some people who come to these programs after a long time. They don't understand these terminologies. So if I overspeak or I say too much Arabic, just raise your hand. What does that mean? Because yesterday someone came to me and like, what does Quraysh mean? So there are people who are coming to the ummah, which I respect from different walks of life. So sometimes the Arabic language can be heavy, so I apologize. But when the Prophet ﷺ comes back from the cave in Khadija radiallahu anha, he first place he goes to his wife, Khadija radiallahu anha. I know a lot of people, the first time they have some challenges, who do they call first? Not their wife, right? They, they, I mean, they don't want to share these type of difficulties or moments or good moments, sad moments. Or, you know, that's, the, how com- that's how comfortable Prophet ﷺ was with Khadija radiallahu anha. He comes home and he says, Khadija, zammiluni, dathiruni. I need you to cover me. He's shiv- shivering, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sweating, nervous, and he's, he's getting sick at, by the moment. 
and Khadija radiallahu anha is covering the Prophet sallallahu alaihi The Prophet sallallahu alaihi is in a state of anxiety. It's not in the words, but it's it's not written in the the wording, but it's in the fine lining of the wording. I'm gonna tell you what that is. The Prophet Khadija radiallahu anha says to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "Wallahi la yuzikallahu abada." I swear Allah will never waste you, because you look like the state of anxiety, full of, um, um, you know, you're, you're, you're feel insecure about what's happening. This whole traumatic experience. From us, we know it was Iqra. But for the Prophet ﷺ, imagine being squeezed where you can't breathe and losing your, to almost as a situation in a dark cave. No one can hear your pain. Coming down from that. Imagine every step the Prophet's taking down from Ghar. You know, Jabl al-Nur. What he was going through. Now we're saying that was Iqra. But for the Prophet ﷺ, this was, this was painful. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Khadija says, لَنْ يَخْزِقَ اللَّهُ أَبَدًا إِنَّكَ لَتَصِلَ الرَّحَمُ O Prophet of Allah, وَتَحْمِلُ الْكَلْوَ وَتَكْسِبُ الْمَعْدُومُ وَتُقْرِيُ الضَّيْفُ وَتُعِينُهُ عَلَى نَوَائِبِ الْحَقِّ The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was told by Khadija five, six virtues that he does. He said, you help the poor, you stand up for those who are, in, who are vulnerable, who are ignored in society, you are the one who takes care of guests, what you like? You're an activist for the society. Any problem of a person's life, you're the first person they will come to. They trust you. I think that's kind of Khadija, what she said in Bukhari. But I'll tell you something what I, fi- I find. I feel like Khadija was waiting 20, she was waiting for how many years? Like 15 years, because she married the Prophet when he was 25, correct? She was waiting for this moment. She knew something special about Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi came back with May Sada from Sham, Khadija was on top of her balcony and she said to, her, uh, to the ladies in Mecca, come here, come here, come here. Got everybody from the city, top of the house. I knew, I've been telling you about this man, Muhammad, he's special, but you guys don't understand. Look, wherever he's walking, there's a cloud covering him. She knew something was special about this person, but she didn't know what it was. And when it actually happened, she's embracing the Prophet ﷺ in her mind. She's like, oh Allah, this was the moment. This is the moment I've been waiting for. This person is beyond human, you know, um, and any virtue of human level. This is a divine virtue. So what I find from Khadija is that I think she believed in the Prophet, you know, before he even got revelation. <laughs> Do you understand? Like, she was waiting for this moment. Of course, people say she was the first person. But how was she the first person? She had an idea. This was special. And she accepts the Prophet Sallallahu message. And the, the sad part of this is that the support she gave as a wife, as an individual, Abu Bakr, we talk about Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr. You know, Abu Bakr has narrations, Abu Bakr has children, you know, and talk, we talk so much about him. He is the greatest Sahabi, no doubt. But when you look at Khadija, she, in the 10th year, after the boycott, she gets sick, and she gets weak, and she's walking um, to the Prophet Sallallahu and she's bringing a, a dish of food. And Jibreel comes from the heavens, and says to the Prophet Sallallahu هَذِهِ خَدِيجَةَ أَتَتْكَ بِإِنَائٍ فِيهِ طَعَامٌ أَوْ شَرَابٌ This is... Khadija coming to you or Idam. This is uh, Khadija coming to you. She has a plate. There's something in this. But he, uh, uh, Jibreel doesn't know. He's saying it could, be, it could be food. It could be a drink. It could be something. Uh, you know, it could be a type of meal. When, when, but she's coming to you. When she gets to you, tell her. Tell her. Please tell her. Allah is giving salam to her. Allah is giving salam to Khadija. First one to believe. And then she said, uh, 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 Jibreel. Sneaks in his salam. Wa minni, give my salam too. And then we t- want to tell her something special. Tell her. She may not see the fruits of her reward or struggle in this world, but she's promised a palace in Jannah. And the two things which are the properties of this palace, la nasab wa la wasab. Nasab and wasab, one is noise and one is fatigue. One is like, you know, Khadija in those 10 years, all she heard were negative things against the Prophet ﷺ. You know, when you're a wife, when you're a sister, you have a family, and all you hear negative things about your family. It's overwhelming, the stress, the drama. Imagine someone calling your family member Majnoon. Imagine someone calling you crazy for marrying him. Imagine someone calling the father of your children, Sha'ir, Kahin, Sorcerer. And where's Khadija in this back end? She's listening. She's comforting the Prophet ﷺ. The entire time the Prophet ﷺ is going through fatigue. And he, she was such a supporter of the Prophet ﷺ. The children come from Khadija, you know. And remember, I remember this narration. It gets me so, 
It gets me so emotional. One day, the Prophet was sitting with Aisha, and Aisha, the Allah on her, he, she got a little triggered by the Prophet always talking about Khadija. You know how like, if the Prophet was sitting here, every lecture he would bring up Khadija. That's how much he loved Khadija, the Allah on her. Anywhere he would get, he would sneak in a Khadija discussion. So Aisha, the Allah on her, she's like, you know, so I want to be honest with you, Prophet of Allah, she's history. Abdalakallahu khayram minha. Just look up. You got someone way better than Khadija. Someone younger, someone more beautiful. You marry this woman who is far older than you. I mean, just get over that pass. And the typical response of the Prophet was, you guys know his response in statements like this? Can anyone tell me? How is his response, guys? Come on, someone tell me. Huh? No, no, don't tell me what she told. In a typical time, not, not this moment, but any time when someone would say something hurtful to the Prophet, would it hurt his feelings, how would it respond? My man, my man. Give him a round of applause. My man. He would smile. He would just smile. That was, this was so salam. Can you imagine? He can, he can just, you know, inflate the situation. You know, like just excuse the whole situation with a smile. And his smile was so beautiful. Right? So he typically would just smile and like, okay, khalas, you know. No, not now. He says, Wallahi, ma khayra minha. To be honest, I know you're talking about yourself. You ain't nowhere close to her. You know, and that's not typical of the Prophet. I swear Allah has not replaced me with someone better than Khadija. She believed, this is Sabiqun. She believed in me when no one believed in me. She supported me when no one supported me. And I had my children from Khadija, radiallahu anh, all the pious, righteous children of the Prophet from Khadija except Ibrahim. So brothers and sisters, we might not see our results. You know, and see Sheikh Masmari brought this up as a Mifta example and uh, as a Ummah example. And I'll say it in front of Mufti Duha, who both of these guys work so hard. I, I, I ask myself the numbers that Ummah and Mifta is seeing in short span of work. Is this a test from Allah to see how we will react? And Ni'mah. Or is this a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or another way of Allah telling us, you guys, are, you guys are weak. Let me just spoil you with more people. Like, I don't think you can wait 10 years to see the results. Let me just give you the results early because you guys are not Sahaba. So I look at the situation like we're seeing all these people come here because it's not, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showing us early. Like, you guys, this type of results in the Sahaba time, Umar ibn Khattab was number 66, six years later, as a Muslim to accept Islam. So really, Khadija did not see, and the minute the Prophet ﷺ passed away, you know, Khadija radiallahu anha passed away, the Prophet ﷺ was overwhelmed with grief. The year of Huzn begins. But really, she, she's the one that really gave the Prophet ﷺ the most support. And honestly, sisters and brothers, we give the example, these two, on the backs of two individuals, that, that everyone wanted to be like them. Everyone was competing. The, all the Sahaba were competing to be like Abu Bakr and Khadija. They were the, they were the goal. You know, they were the best. Umar the Allah was like, I want to be like Abu Bakr. Everyone wants to be like these people because they did it in the best way. So I think about Khadija the Allah and her so much. And I, and I think about Sheikh Masmari he said, she didn't see the results. All she saw was her, her husband being troubled, her pain, hardship. So it's, in the end of the day, she worked for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She's honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet said, the greatest woman that walked on this earth, Khadija, Fatima, Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun, and Maryam. She never saw the results. She, you won't, maybe you might not see the results of your sacrifice. Everyone said Musab bin Umair. Everyone said Ja'far. You know, sometimes, like Abdurrahman bin Auf would say, I fear that all the efforts that we're doing, we're getting the reward for it today, and we might not get it in the next life. Because the results are coming so fast. And I, that's what the Sahaba would think. They would think like this. So really, Sheikh Masmani, you're right. You know, to speak to two people, it's not easy. From one year, two years. Even Nuh alayhi salam complained about it after 950 years. He was a prophet. So results do matter. And you guys are showing up. And I think it's because Allah knows how weak we are as scholars. We can't speak to two people. We won't be able to do it. We, who are we going to teach if we don't have people like you come around? 
So we're grateful to you, brothers and sisters, being here this late at night. But remember, people better than us never saw the results. They struggled. They, they were like, Allah is pleased with us. That's what matters the most. This hadith of Jibreel, when she gives, the salam came to Khadija, few months right after, a few months later, Khadija passed away. That's like the final time of Khadija in this world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us tawfiq for the sisters and the brothers, you know, to be righteous like them. You know, every, every guy says, I want to marry a Khadija. You know, I want to find my Khadija. When I got married, you know, I got married, I put um, books of the biography of Khadija, Aisha, Hafsa, ideal wife, ideal mother. Some books that are written overseas by scholars that translated horrible translations, you know, but really like tough stories of how a wife should be. Just got married. My wife was 18 years old. You know, she likes to read and I like to give books to people. So I put it on her um, a nightstand and I would come daily to see, like I would hide to see if you opened the book. I wouldn't see a bookmark, but the books are still there. I'm like, okay, at least you didn't move them. So I was like three weeks, I'm like, have you read anything? You know, maybe we can have a romantic or spiritual discussion, you know, how we do in the MSA, you know, you know, let's, let's talk about religion and also fall in love, you know. So, so I'm like, maybe I could do that with my wife, actually, which is allowed. And um, so I brought that, I, guys, don't laugh too loud. You can expose yourself. Don't, don't do it. You're going to, I'm going to call you out, you know. Don't give me that much leverage. So event, eventually, I said to my, I said to my wife, I said, have you tried? He's like, so what's your end goal with all these books? I said, I want you to become like Hafsa, Aisha. And then she says, if you want me to become the Khadija and the Hafsa that you want, then you have to be the Abu Bakr and the Prophet. You got to be the mirror of the opposite person. You can't just read a book and ask someone to be this perfect individual, ideal individual, and you, your own self and your own worries and world. So really, I learned a lot from that statement since then. Honestly, we, are, we, are, we will find the partner of our life, like Khadija, if we have the character of Rasulullah And if we find someone as good as Khadija, you guys want to clap? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Sisters getting all excited. I'm coming to you right now too when the lads going to clap. You can, the night's short. It's just started. All right? It's not all about the ladies. I know the ladies get excited when someone says something. Brother, I'm coming for you. Man, I'm a man. I'll stand up for you guys. I'm not going to lose my gender for this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> you know, there's a guy in my masjid that commits me. I'm like, you the man. You the man. He's older, Ammu, Syrian. After like four years, I'm saying this, like, Ammu, I'm so happy you've identified my gender. <laughs> Thank you. Like, can you say something else? So really, you know, to, to identify that person, and if you marry the right person, Khadija, or you marry a, a person like Omar bin Khattab or Khalid bin Walid, this great personality. And if you, if you don't line up and you don't see eye to eye, that relationship won't be uh, fruitful because you guys are not in the same pay wavelength, spiritually, motivationally. You might do injustice to that person's life. You might do disservice to that person's life because they want to pray and you have other, they want to they give charity, you're holding them back. And there are a lot of people like this. So brothers and sisters, you want to be sabiqoon? You want to find someone that's sabiqoon? You got to place yourself in those environments. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant me tawfiq to be amongst the sabiqun. I'm going to give it back to these guys. You know, I've overspoken. When I've, every time I speak about marriage, I get emotional. Sheikh Masmai. Why are you crying for Sheikh Masmai? It's marriage. No, no. I don't care about the marriage part. Um, Subhanallah. Khadija makes us feel so small. Wow. And... Um, why are you laughing? Why, why are you guys laughing for? That's that statement. You know? Like, when does that ever happen? Where, uh, for like, when we hear that kind of statement, Khadija makes you feel so small. Subhanallah. The they would describe Khadija. They would say a female that carried the badge of prophethood. That was Khadija. She's a female version of a prophet. And they would say, Qalbun bi qalbi nabi. That was Khadija. And subhanAllah, I feel like we're a result, all of us here are a result of Khadija. Radiallahu anha wa alihi salam. Like how good can you be as a woman where the Prophet of Allah seeks comfort in you? It's like how good of a person was she? That she made the one 
who is the source of comfort and guidance, the Prophet ﷺ, she made him come to her and seek that comfort. And, and, and subhanAllah, when I look at it, I ask myself, why, why Khadija? And because if, if all of what we said connected to Rasulullah only, we will find some difficulty in relating to the Prophet Sunnah when it comes to him going above and beyond. But Allah has allowed us to see Khadija as a role model, as a typical normal human being that had a career. Allah has normalized Khadija for us. Stop coming up with excuses. Stop saying I'm busy. Stop saying um, I have my own world and my life ahead of me. Uh, or I don't know where I'm going when it comes to whatever initiative you've embarked on. Khadija had all the distractions, all the beauty, all the connections. But she knew what she had to do and she did it for the sake of Allah. And this is why Rasulullah couldn't figure, for, uh, forget Khadija radiallahu anha. He just couldn't. And, and this is what makes Rasulullah unique too. Sometimes these people that came from the beginning also need to be appreciated. Like, can you imagine every sacrifice Rasulullah sacrificed, he gave a portion of that for Khadija. Wow. Like, ha every, every time. And every time the Prophet would hear a knock on the door, he would say, Allahumma hala. Oh Allah, make it hala, the sister of Khadija. Why? Because hala, when she would give salam, she sounded like Khadija radiallahu anha. It's just the Prophet ﷺ always felt indebted to Khadija. There were two people, and for me, these are the best people that walked on the face of this earth after the Anbiya. Khadija and Abu Bakr. These two amazing people. You know, even the Prophet ﷺ, when he spoke about Abu Bakr and the Sabq, and everyone somehow found a way to break their backyard into the masjid door, into the masjid wall. So they would walk from their backyard, and they cracked a hole, and they would walk through that to the masjid. And the Prophet ﷺ noticed so many doors and it just didn't look good anymore. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Close all the doors. Only Abu Bakr's door. Just don't close his. SubhanAllah. Why? Because Abu Bakr, he, he said, Everyone here, we've given them back what they deserve. Everyone. He said, إِلَّا أَبُوْ بَكْرِ Only Abu Bakr, فَإِنَّ الدَّخَرْ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ الدَّخَرَ جَزَاءَهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Allah will reward Abu Bakr. So subhanAllah, just taking on initiatives and stop, stop, stop engaging in this where people are fascinated with excitement. A lot of people are excited to do something when it's cool and when no one is there, the, 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 the effort goes away. Like do something for Allah, whatever that is, you can pick it in your mind. But feel more comfortable doing it in private than doing it in public. Feel more comfortable when you're alone than doing it with a group. If that feeling is not experienced, then this person lacks sincerity. A lot of people nowadays, they just go with the hype. It's hype, I'm there. There's no hype, I'm gone. And this shows why our efforts are not lasting. Like you don't see what's happening. There's a lot of khair, but a lot of our efforts are not with everything that is happening, we should see more. But because we, we have these hiccups down the line that affect our sincerity. So please always praise Khadija and make dua and at least say, Radiallahu anha, Jazahallahu anna khaira. We always praise the Prophet. Sallallahu praise the likes of Khadija. Make dua for her. Because of her, we're Muslims. Make dua for Abu Bakr. Just say, Jazahallahu anna khaira. Make dua for the Sahaba. Ridwanullah alayhim. And uh, so, Barakallah. Takbir. I want to, um, Sheikh Masri, give Sheikh Masri a round of applause, guys. <laughs> Sheikh Masri, you almost got emotional talking about Khadija, you know, may, may Allah fill our hearts with their love. You know, we say these people's names, we're so lucky to even know them. You know, like, I feel like some of these Sahaba, we're going to see, you know, sometimes when you watch someone on screen for such a long time, and you, you, you think you know more about them, you know everything about them. So when you see them, you're like, hey, you're so excited, because you, you know, you've been seeing them for so many years online. I feel like, inshallah, when we see these Sahaba, 
And we talked about like, oh, boy, it's all my Bible, some of them. And then I read all these stories about you. He's going to look at me like, who are you, man? He's like, back off a little bit, back off, you know? It make me uncomfortable. But like, even like Khadija, like these pious people, like, they're not strangers to us. You know, we should, we should be excited to hear their stories and name our daughters after their names. They're such beautiful names. Sheikh Abdul Wahab, if, um, you're not in the mood? You see? Huh? Let's end it? Uh, they want to end it. Do you guys want to end it? So, you know, we'll end it, inshallah. And you guys said, no, it's late. It's late. But I just want to say, guys, on the, uh, Sheikh Abdul Wahab, if you can just conclude a little bit with some kind words and wise words, all the structural stuff you have, you know, all this very knowledgeable stuff. Go ahead. Well, I think <clears throat> the, the stories of Khadija عنها, that you guys spoke about, it's probably the best place to conclude. Um, I'll try to give some, hopefully some tangible tips of understanding sabqa again, and I'll conclude with what I started. Um, it's important to discuss sabqa and competitiveness and racing forward for actions. But before the action comes the mentality. Mm. In order to have sabqa and doing something good, we have to have sabqa and accepting something as well. Can I ask you something? Yeah. So why do you think Okasha mm -hmm. was able to stand up when the Prophet ﷺ said, there are 70,000 people that are going to go to Jannah without any hisab. And, and a sahabi stands up and he says, Oh Allah, make, Oh Prophet, make dua that I'm from amongst those people. And the Prophet ﷺ said, what was, what was the, the main ingredient in that personality? What do you think it was? Not, I mean, the main ingredient was he was he was attracted to the outcome. The Jannah. The Jannah was attract. It was an attractive outcome for them. You know what I think it was. Okay. You're right. I feel like it probably. You know. You're right. You know. You know. He's my younger brother, man. I can't listen. I, I tell me if I'm wrong. You know when someone's thinking about something, like how can a person? I say, guys, like if the if the Prophet said there's there are seventy thousand people that enter Jannah without hisab, he's not even asking who wants it. He's just 70,000 people entering Jannah without his help. He's not saying, who wants to be on society? Now I can see someone standing up. You're the first person. You understand? Like, if you phrase it that way. He says, And the Prophet says, didn't say, who wants to be the first amongst them? He didn't say that. Guy jumps up. And he said, Allah, Allah, Ya Rasul, Allah, Ya Ja'ani Minhum. So my, my question to Shaykh Abdul Wahab, and he answered it. He, that was his objective. But I think like, you know, what we're, what's on our mind? Like this guy must have been so excited. He might be thinking about it so much, so much, so much. That even the hint of the idea of being amongst them, he jumped at it. It literally, right there on the edge of his mind. Like, do you guys understand what I'm saying? Like, you know when you're looking for a house? You understand? On Zillow or Realtor? You guys understand what I'm saying, right? You're looking for something to buy, some furniture or a car. And the minute that car comes in the market, you're the first one to put a bid for it or make an offer. Go see it. For these people, I feel like Okasha was like, like on the website of Jannah. <laughs> like, you know, when is it, when, when's it available? When's it available? And the minute the Prophet said something about it, he jumped at it. And there was other people like, oh, the Prophet's hanging out, handing out paradise. So another Sahabi stands up. He said, Rasulullah, me too, me too. Include me, I want to be in Jannah without any question. It's a big deal. The Prophet ﷺ didn't say, oh, let me make dua for you too. No, no, no. He said, Sabaqaka biha Okasha. This guy beat you to it. I'm not saying you're not going to be amongst them, but the fact that you're thinking about Jum'ah, you're thinking about Tahajjud, you're thinking about charity, you're thinking about this, the first opportunity will come, you'll give it. So that's why I wanted to... No, no, beautiful. Sorry, I took your, your no, moment. No, <laughs> you took my moment, but that was, that was a beautiful story. So I have even less time now. So that was a beautiful story, though. That's a powerful story. May Allah bless Sheikh Abdullah for bringing that up. Takbir. Sheikh Abdullah loves Takbir. You guys know, you guys have been around. No, I like, I like clap. Yeah, no, we're not doing that right now. We, we did. But... um. What I was mentioning is, in order for us to be, in order for us to have a competitive edge in sabqa in doing something good, we have to have a, we have to have the sabqa, we have to have the mentality of accepting quick as well. So the Prophet ﷺ spoke about Abu Bakr radiAllahu anhu and gave him the title Siddiq, not because of what he did, but rather because of how fast he accepted the story of Mi'raj, that he heard it from Abu Jahl. And the moment Abu Jahl said it to him, that there's a man who says that they traveled overnight in a portion of a night all the way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and came back and bit al and so on and so forth. Abu Bakr al did not try to rationalize this journey through the people around him, his society, the people who were even telling him. He simply said, if the Prophet said it, it has to be true. So my dear friends, if we want to be a sabiqun or have even an image of that in our life, we should have no delay in accepting that which is the truth from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That which is the truth from the Prophet sallallahu If something is true, but I can't do it, it's different than me saying that it's not true. 
If someone comes to us or we hear a hadith or we hear an ayah that speaks about something being haq, something being right, and that which is wrong, the ability to accept the truth is a sign of us hopefully one day being able to implement it very quickly as well. Therefore, Abu Bakr anhu throughout his life, he was always the first one. It wasn't coincidental. It was because his mentality was that way. That he accepted the Prophet's truth the moment he gave it to him. There was no delay. And when he became Muslim, it was the same. He wasn't a Siddiq per se because he was the first Sahaba. He was a Siddiq because he accepted it the quickest. He accepted it in his mind. Doing it with our actions is much later. We may not even get the opportunity to make those sacrifices. But the mentality of accepting the deen of Allah as a primary source of reference is sabqa. Someone says to me, this is haram. Now, if it is actually haram, the first response shouldn't be, well, I don't think so. Sabqa means I accept it. Sami'na wa ata'na. I accept it. Now, can I actually apply it in my life? I may be weak. I don't know. But accepting it, this is why when the Prophet went for hijrah and he stopped at Abu Bakr al-Anu's house, he already had the camels ready. It was already ready because the mindset was, I accept everything. When the Prophet in the journey of uh, in the journey of Tabuk, when he was asking who's going to bring money, right? You guys know the famous story. Abdurrahman al-Uthman brings one third, Umar al brings half, and he says to him, I'm going to beat Abu Bakr. And Abu Bakr al-Anu brings all of his wealth. It's because the mentality was already structured that I will accept whatever the Prophet says. So when he calls upon me, there's no delay in my responding to him. That's number one. So our mentalities has to be of acceptance from the words of the Prophet and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That, that is how we can gauge whether or not when the call comes, if I'm going to be ready. Everyone says, I'll be ready for this. When the Mahdi comes, I'll be ready. But I'm, am I able to accept that what I'm listening to is haram? That's sabqa. Am I able to accept that this part of my life needs to be removed? Am I able to accept that I need to start doing certain things as a mentality? Because if I'm not, when that call comes upon us, we will be the last people in the row. Like the people of, uh, of Uhud, they ran away when the battle started. Because the mentality wasn't made. You can't convince someone whose mindset is already shattered. The mindset is sabqa, number one. Number two, for all of us youngsters, we always say, when I make it, watch what I do for this deen. I'll be the Musa, I'll be the Sabiq then. Watch. When I make it. If our talents and our resources and our time and our energy are not being used to serve the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at some capacity, then what is it truly being used for? There's not a person that is more selfish than an individual who only uses his blessings for himself. Use it to serve Allah's deen. If it means if you find someone, we run away from an opportunity of sabqa. The, the janazah, I don't want to be the first one there. If I be the first one at the maqbara, I have to wait for the body to come for so long. I can't go there first. We'll delay. We'll take a detour. We'll stop at a gas station. We'll go to Tim Hortons because I don't want to be the first one at the janazah. Because I have to wait so long. If we end up leaving our home and we're going to be early for salat, like I want to be so early, what am I going to do? I, I can't even go early to the masjid. Because the mindset is, what am I going to do? Why would I go early to the janazah? Why would I go early to the masjid? And when there's something for us to receive, I'm the first one there. I'll be there in line early because I'm taking something. When I have to give something, I'm the last one there. This is why Munafiqun were always in the back when it came time to give charity. So whatever we have, resources and talent, it will diminish and it will decrease if it's not being used in the path of Allah. It's there today, but tomorrow it won't be. There were many people that were talented amongst, amongst the Munafiqun. Better speakers than us, better looking than us. Allah says, وَإِذَا رَأَيْتَهُمْ تُعْجِبُكَ أَجَسَامُهُمْ when you would see them, they would, their appearance would, 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 would make you dumbfounded. You would be in awe of their appearance. When they would stand, their demeanor, their presence, their persona, their, their charisma was nothing like what we have. And when they would speak, everyone would listen. I, people listen to me. I speak in front of people, not my son, all of us. In a gathering, people listen. If I'm standing, people look at me. They had it better than us. Allah says, musannada. They brought no benefit to the world. They were like a twig. That any time a wind would come, it would fall down. Because they were only worried about themselves. They would say, Wallahi, if Allah gives us money, if Allah gives us resources, if Allah makes me a physician, if Allah makes me an engineer, if Allah makes me a sheikh, watch what I do for the ummah. Watch. Allah says, min fadli. When it actually comes, بَخِلُوا bihi." They become stingy. Not only that, وَتَوَلَّوْ And they find a way out. وَتَوَلَّوْ They don't want to be seen because if you're seen, you'll be called upon. 
They don't want to be seen in the gathering anymore because now people will ask him for certain things. So as a youngster, we're, at, we're waiting for the moment that we will be able to do something and serve. That moment is now. Like if the, if the elder is walking to the door and you can open the door for him, that's called sabqa. That is sabqa. If the khala is walking and you can open the door for her, that's called sabqa. Leave that friend for a moment and help that khala, help that uncle. Even saying salam, the Prophet says, whoever says salam first has more iman. And that doesn't refer to friends and colleagues. Saying salam first means you have more iman is when there's an awkwardness there. Not when it's a friend because that's already, that's already going to happen anyways. That doesn't prove a person's iman. What proves a person's iman is when they say salam to someone first who wasn't expected to say salam to you. But you reached out to them. Or else saying salam to your friends doesn't really increase one's faith in regards to that. Of course, it forgives your sins and so on and so forth. So we have to find, and the people, the people who have that mentality will find the opportunities. And for the people who don't have the mentality, they will run away from the opportunities. That's number two. Number three, we keep talking about Khadija Abu Bakr al-Anu. The Prophet also called the Sabiq. We are the last of people, but we, the, we will be the first ones to enter Jannah. The Prophet of Allah spoke about us as Sabiqun as well. He said, I want to meet my brothers and sisters. I want to meet them because they believed in me without even seeing me. We're also Sabiq. وَالسَّابِقُونَ السَّابِقُونَ أُولَٰئِكَ الْمُقَرَّبُونَ In the ayah it says, ثُلَّةٌ مِنَ أَوَّلِينَ وَقَلِّلُ مِنَ آخِرِينَ In the tafsir it mentions that by percentage, the Sabiqun amongst the Sahabas was 99%. And by percentage, the sabiqun of those that came in later generations will decrease and decrease and decrease and decrease. So for example, in our, in our time, the sabiqun may be 20%. But the potential of becoming a sabiq is still there for people like us. And on the day of judgment, we will be raised with those who were sabiqs at that time. He has no hall of fame. At the end of the day, if you make it into the hall of fame, you made it into the hall of fame. They call it the class of 2024, the class of 2023, the class of 2022. But at the end, they all wear the same jacket. They're all a part of the Hall of Fame. Similarly, on the Day of Judgment, the people who are sabiqun will all be looking the same. Wow. We'll all be a part of the same gathering. We'll be called upon with our leaders. And a narration Imam Qutb rahimullah says, and I'll end with this, Bijan Sheikh sorry, the last point so that I'll make. So he says, on the Day of Judgment, Allah will call people with their Imam. Who is their Imam? And he mentions their Imam is those who they all want, who the, two things, who they always want to be around and who they always want to be like. Whoever you want to be around is your imam. And who you want to be like is also your imam. So if you want to be around these types of people, know that they dictate the moves of your life. And if you want to be like that person, they already, they, they, you already became their slave in that sense. On, in this narration is mentioned, on that day it will be said, Ain a Siddiq. Where is the Siddiq? In the crowd of billions of people, the entirety of humanity will be motionless, Quiet. And in the mass of billions, only one man will stand. And Abu Bakr will move forward as, as a Siddiq. And then the angels will call upon and say, And where are those who were also truthful to their covenant that they made to Allah in whichever era they came in? Imagine us people being on the team of Abu Bakr. People like you and I will stand with the flag of Abu Bakr of a Siddiq because we were also truthful to our covenant. I can imagine people that became shaheed in Gaza, people that became shaheed in America. I can imagine my brother standing with Abu Bakr because he was Siddiq for me. He was truthful to all of his promises. He was truthful to his mother. He was truthful to his craft. And Allah took him without him seeing anything. I can imagine him standing there. Then the caller will say, Ain al faruq in the crowd of billions, no one will move. The Farooq knows who he is. And Umar will move forward. And the caller will say, Where are those who also became a distinguishing factor between the truth and falsehood? We can't be a spectator between truth and falsehood. The greatest manifestation of the truth is a believer. Is a believer. If I sit in a gathering, I am haq. If people are still backbiting, then I am not a manifestation of haq anymore. If I sit in a car and someone listening to haram, I am, I am the display of haq. And if they don't stop, that means they don't see me to be a, a display of haq anymore. Then the caller will say, Ain 
Where is the man who displayed the greatest, the greatest display of modesty, generosity, kindness? And Uthman radiallahu anhu will stand. People like you and I will go with him. Then the caller will say, Aina Sayyida Shababi Ahlil Jannah. Hassan Hussein will stand. Aina Sayyidu Shuhada. Aina Sayyidu Nisa Ahlil Jannah. And then they will call upon all of us. And the caller will also say, Where is Fir'aun? And people will stand with Fir'aun and Haman and Qarun. So that idea of I'm also a Sabiq, that I will be wearing the same color vest as those Sahabas, though I came in an age much later. And I'll end with this. How fortunate are we to come at this age? Because our competition is very low. Imagine having to compete with Abu Bakr and Umar. You know, like, you know, they, they talk about in sports that this year was a low year. So it was easy competition. That's why this person became the MVP. But in a year where you have the best players competing, it's hard to become MVP. In this era, people like you and I can become the MVP. We have the ability. So we actually came at a good time because the competition of sabaqa is not that high. So we actually have a chance to be amongst the sabiqun. If we came in those eras, we would be challenged by those people. We would be in the back rows. No one would even look at us. In this era, we actually have a chance. May Allah make us amongst those. Wallahu alam. Takbir. Uh, one more, guys. Let it loud one. Takbir. Round of applause for Mufti Wahab, Sheikh Al Masmari. Guys, um, may Allah reward you guys for being here. Um, beautiful sessions. I'm telling you, I'm just listening to both of these guys. I'm just, I wish I was sitting there. So you guys can't see my reaction. So beautiful. Thank you so much, Mufti Sheikh Abdul Nasmari. May Allah reward you both. May Allah bless you guys' lives. Say Amin, guys. May Allah give them long lives, afia, barakah. May we continue to benefit from the scholars locally, you know, in our communities. Uh, Ustad Asad is here. We wish you joined us. We, you know, some of us, we, we don't, we, we, I mean, we would make space for you if we were a little thinner on, on this. No, we really enjoy your presence. So, uh, brothers and sisters, keep us in your du'as. We, pre we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts all our du'as in Ramadan. Ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase the khair and ummah in this, in this center. The work that you guys are doing, may Allah multiply all the sisters who are here who are sacrificing their time. May Allah accept all their du'as. All the brothers who are here, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your du'as. All the brothers and sisters who want to get married, I want you guys to say ameen very loud. I didn't make the dua yet. <laughs> I didn't make the dua. Like, I'm about to make the dua. I mean, gosh. The angel's like, this guy's desperate. He's getting married yesterday. <laughs> you know, all those brothers and want to get, sisters who want to get married in the future to a pious spouse, give me a loud I mean. What? No, no, making no. dua for their kids too, for them. We're going to the kids in a second. Those who want to get married with Afia to a pious spouse, give me a loud I mean, guys. That's soft. Sisters, you can join it too. Go ahead. Those, come on guys, say I mean loud. I mean, you know, angels are not deaf, so they heard your soft I mean, you know. Um, so may Allah accept, and may Allah give us pious children, say I mean. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use us for the service of his cause. What afia, till the death. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us sabiqoon, awwaloon amongst the siddiq, shuhada, salihin. Jazakumullah khair. Barakallah, Sheikh Masmari. Just want to remind everyone, inshallah, uh, tomorrow, um, we, we've announced it so many times already, but inshallah, the 27th night, we're going to be at the Wayne County Community College on Outer Drive. I think you exit out of seven mile in Southfield, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so please make sure uh, this session is also going to be there. So we're going to have the same session around like 1230 or 1215, same time as here, inshallah. Uh, so please make sure you, you begin your can night you imagine there. the numbers are so much that you can't even host them in here. Takbir. MashaAllah. No, no, we just wanted to show off, so we went there. And was, you know, Allah knows how many people are going to come. It's just, it's easier for the people and it's for the logistical reasons. But you all are amazing and beautiful. May Allah preserve you all. Um, it's everyone here that makes the space beautiful, Shaykh. Um, so inshallah, just remember, and if you can, if you know someone that wanted to join, just text them to join there, inshallah. Again, I don't want people to walk through the doors to find the doors shut. It's just not a good, it's not a good look, please. So, um, and again, the address is all over and we sent it on our WhatsApp. If you're not part of the WhatsApp group or our social media, please join to get the latest updates too. Barakallah fikum. Again, don't forget to register for uh, Mercy for Mankind. We want to see, uh, yeah, May 10th, May 11th. Just go to the Miftah website. We really want to see our Michigan community uh, showing up. We have to represent and we look forward to seeing everyone tomorrow. Barakallah fikum. Assalamu alaikum.